All right, guys, welcome back to Misery Point Radio. Thanks for joining me again today. Definitely appreciate all your support. I've got an extra special guest right here waiting to chat with us about a super epic project that I can't wait to dig into. So please welcome to Misery Point Radio writer, director, producer, man of many hats, Richard Bergen. Richard, thanks for hanging out today, man. I appreciate your time. Well, uh, thank you for having me on your show, Mike. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know you're a busy dude. You're doing tons of interviews right now, which is fantastic. I do want to give a quick shout out to our mutual friend, Mr. Steve Joyner from the SJ Network for number one, introducing me to your uh, super amazing project that I'm very excited to talk to you about, but also just for being an all around cool dude who really kind of helps out people in the artistic community. So, uh, so thanks, Steve. Uh, you are a uh, an officer and a gentleman. <laughs> so, uh <laughs> Um, yeah, really cool. I'm excited to talk to you about Fang. So let's kind of chat about that. So you wrote, directed, produced, kind of wore a whole bunch of different hats, took on many roles. Am I correct in that? You are correct. Yes. Well, technically I was the executive producer, so I don't want to take credit sure. for being like the regular producer because that that is one job that I don't see myself doing because it's a tremendous amount of work to kind of keep the production going. And I give my producer, Robert Felker, a lot of credit for keeping us from going off the rails. <laughs> times when, when it looked like we were on a train that was heading for collision. Oh, right on. Awesome. Well, props to you there, Richard. So, so you got this project going, but really at the end of the day, this is kind of a, a, a pet passion project that you've had kind of uh, brewing in your mind for a long time, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I, uh, I started writing the script for Fang in March of 2019, and now we've you know we're about one month away from you know finishing the movie and having an online premiere for it. So it's been about so it's been over a year and a half, which is actually fairly fast. That's pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. So now, if I understand this correctly, this is really uh, your first major release that you've worked on, right? That's right. Yeah. It's, uh, so how does my- how does somebody who's kind of a first time filmmaker get the backing and everything together to really make a project of this magnitude go? I mean, this is something that a lot of people dream about, and here you are, everyday Joe. You know, and all of a sudden you're saying, I've got a movie I'm making. And you know, we all hear it, right? I'm writing a novel. I'm writing a screenplay. I'm writing a movie. I'm writing an album. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And you're like, well, fuck you. I'm actually doing it. So how do you... Everybody thinks I'm just saying that. Yeah, until, right? <laughs> like my mom, always, you know, when I was in the early stages, when I told her I was going to make this movie, she was like, oh, okay. Okay, sweet dear. Me. You have fun with your little movie. <laughs> And one night you heard me talking on the phone, like when I had to take like an important phone call about Fang, and that that's what she realized I was really taking this seriously, and yeah. I was. It. But the way I I got started, honestly, it's been such a kind of twisted process with so many twists and and turns to get to where I am now that I don't have an easy answer for how. I managed to actually do it. I will say that one thing I would say to anybody who who wants to make a movie is uh, try to make it on as low a budget as possible because the less money it costs to make, the more likely it is to get made. If you write something that would require, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars to make, you know, and, and you've never directed a feature film before, it's very unlikely that you'll get financing for, but I was able to do it cheaply enough that I didn't have to get outside financing to make Fang, so that made things a lot easier. So you're self-funding this? Well, it's from my family's uh, money, like from my dad. Right, but it's internal. I mean, you're not you weren't going and, and borrowing money and setting up you know funds and business plans and all this kind of crazy stuff to kind of make this happen. 
that's I'm gonna have to tackle that demon on my next movie. I'm afraid. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you you brought up a good point, though, at least as far as, uh, you know, spec scripts and things like that. You know, when somebody gets their hands on this stuff and they look at this and the first thing they see is, how much money am I going to have to put into special effects or location stuff or, you know, any number of factors? And they watch those dollar signs kind of start racking up where from everything I've seen about Fang, this is really a very character driven movie that kind of focuses on, you know, dialogue internal and external and really not focusing on, say, crazy stuff happening that requires insane amounts of technology. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, there is some crazy stuff that happens, but it didn't require too much technology to pull off because the the insanity of Fang is very kind of rooted in the relationships between the characters and the conditions that they live in and how their lives kind of spiral out of control. Sure. Yeah, well, let's let's kind of dig into this then. So uh, if I'm on the right track, the basic elevator pitch, uh, young janitor by the name of Billy gets bitten by a rat. You know, at some point after that, he kind of starts to believe that he is himself becoming a rat and then i assume that that's really kind of where the movie takes its core theme from which is exploring the nature of reality right what's it really about and are we as viewers kind of forced to make a decision is this actually happening to him or is this kind of happening in his head no yeah that's that's what the movie's about and i definitely i do want to leave it ambiguous for now whether he's he's really (laughs) sure i don't want to give away any spoilers you know this early in the game because i've been guilty of uh giving away spoilers before so when i came in you know when it came time to promote fang i'm like you know what i I gotta try to keep my lips sure a little bit i don't want to be a squealer (laughs) you gotta you gotta maintain some element of surprise right so you know as i'm as i'm doing some research and i'm kind of looking at you know the stills and kind of the little promos that you've been throwing out on the website here and there just little bits and teasers that say keep people interested i'm reminded of a few things it so it kind of my brain is reminded of like for instance a cross between jacob's ladder and willard and spider-man and all these kind of cool elements of movies that aren't really related but kind of have some of the same overlying themes the fly you know uh which and then i don't know if you're familiar with like kafka's uh you know metamorphosis of course so that's really all those different things that's a good way to describe it because i think that what i've always said is that you know obviously everybody has you know different influences different things that influence them. There's no such thing as a purely original idea right. for a movie or a story or anything else. But I think when you have as many different influences as possible and then you kind of synthesize them together, that that's how you kind of come up with something unique. That and drawing from different life experiences you've had too, because I think that a lot of filmmakers fall into the trap of being just influenced by other movies but you know when you look at the world around you there are so many crazy and interesting things going on that that seems like a gold mine of you know ideas to me anyway that's a great way to look at it a gold mine of ideas the the world is uh, uh, good ideas <laughs> and bad ideas right so uh, it's you know when you think about influences you know I, it's you know i'm a musician you know and i talk to a lot of musicians and I, and you know the film industry and, and the music industry are not wholly different they they have kind of a lot of the same parallels but you so get it's that it's harder to make it as a musician especially now i feel for you man yeah let me tell you it's uh, i'm glad i'm not on the performing side of things anymore and i just uh i i kind of get my jollies talking to people behind the scenes so i can still stay relevant but yeah it, it's it's tough you know when you're talking about influences and you hit the nail on the head there everything in some capacity is kind of derivative of something else you know and in the film industry and the music industry Things that are truly original, truly avant-garde, truly just way out there in, say, right field, 
tend to be the things that people shy away from in the sense of studios or investors. You know, it's taking a risk on a on a you know a new IP is a very risky endeavor. You know, it, it's there's a certain level of a comfort zone that people like to stay in, and they might get pushed a little out of the comfort zone. But, you know, when you start just ripping people's expectations out and just going way off, I mean, you know, we'll call it David Lynch style, right? That guy does yeah. some crazy stuff. Uh, but somehow he manages to stay kind of in there, right? He's just kind of still re- towing that gray area of, you know, not quite going over the edge. But so I'm looking at Fang and I'm thinking that this is got some themes that we all know and love, but really seems to take it to the next level so tell us about the process of how you developed the story you started writing this and what kind of changed along the way how did it how did it uh, adapt because we all know in the film business there's a saying writing is rewriting well i think that i didn't actually make too many major changes while i was writing Thing. There was one plot element that I changed where originally, you know, Billy had two parents that I just decided to just limit it to his mother and have the line about his father dying when he was six, because I think that just kind of narrowing it down to those, you know, three main characters, you know, Billy, his mother, Gina, and the family's caregiver, Myra, I think that's exactly the right number of characters for that family unit and there and i couldn't see any reason to have him have two parents because it would seem like it would kind of diminish the impact of the drama and then the other things i changed were fairly minor like originally i had billy working as a janitor at a meat packing plant but when we realized we couldn't get any filming locations that would resemble a meat packing plant. I changed it. <laughs> to, to, <laughs> I changed it so it would be a factory that makes meat processing equipment. Oh, so because you could get access to a factory or a warehouse yeah. setting. Yeah. That's very uh, that's very Robert Rodriguez style, by the way. I don't know if you're familiar with like uh, when he was making El Mariachi, he was constantly like. Uh, switching up his locations and the way that his people looked because he was like, oh, I went from having all my guys dressed in Armani suits to now it's just a bunch of dudes in jeans and cowboy boots <laughs> because I couldn't I couldn't gather together enough Armani suits for 12 guys, you know. Um, oh, yeah, those are expensive. I mean, and, and when you have kind of limited time and limited uh, budget, you know, there's only so much you can do. And so sometimes you have to make compromises. But as long as the compromises don't compromise the true nature of the movie, then I'm, I'm willing to compromise. Cause I think, I mean, if anything, meat processing equipment plant is more unusual than just a meat packing plant. So sure. You know, I when don't... you think meat packing plant, you think like old mafia films and guys hanging up in the freezer. And so, you know, that's been yeah, done, yeah. right. That's, that's kind of been out there a million times. So, you know, having something else that's kind of related but its own thing probably hasn't been approached too many times in movies, so it does give you that kind of element Absolutely. of uniqueness. Yeah, that's... Well, I think, yeah, you end up... I think I think creativity comes from being kind of, you know, your limitations, and you have to work within your limitations to come up with something new. Because I think, if anything, if you're just given, like, a blank canvas and unlimited money that it's going to be harder to come up with something than if you have all these limitations that you have to work with. Yeah. Sometimes it's uh, thinking on your feet is the mark of a true professional. You can deal with whatever circumstance is thrown at you. And maybe it kind of deviates from the original, you know, uh, direction, but not necessarily deviates from the vision. So now you've come up with a situation and you're like, hell yeah, I just conquered that. What else you got for me? You know, bring it on. That's right. Yeah, it's uh, there are always there are always so many different things that come up, you know, while you're while you're filming, because there are so many different scenes and days of filming. We had 23 days of filming, and and it went surprisingly smoothly overall. We never had to do any reshoots. We didn't go over budget. Wow. But there were, yeah, there. But there were a couple of days where 
things got pretty bad as far as things going wrong on set. Like we were filming in uh, one house, which was going to be one of our major filming locations, but then the heating went out <laughs> in the house. <laughs> And then there was this kind of a general electrical failure and the TV in the living room actually caught on fire. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's like, there's a smoke coming out of it. And then we decided that we can't film in this house anymore. So we had to find a different house. And thankfully we were able to do that pretty quickly and that, <laughs> and things went much more smoothly from there. Yeah. Who wired that house, by the way, that guy's fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was kind of a dilapidated uh, house that had been around the block quite a few times, uh, and, it was, and it was not in a good neighborhood. But in the, it was in the winter. We filmed in Chicago in January and February, so it was it was cold, and we were also concerned that you know the snow might ruin continuity. Oh yeah, right. Something outdoor scenes but thankfully that turned out not to be a problem i thank global warming for, <laughs> for not giving us any major snowstorms during the filming of thing well hey there you go if you're gonna make lemonade out of lemons right uh you know 23 Absolutely. days of uh, good continuity is pretty epic so <laughs> that's true the uh uh this so this uh this project is, or, or this movie is billed as a psychological horror. At least that's how it's referred to by the outside. Is that a good descriptor of kind of the direction you're taking with it? Oh, yeah. No, it's definitely Fang is a psychological horror film. I think in a sense, I would almost refer to it as a kind of a slice of life drama for a good chunk of the movie. But then the drama escalates into horror as the character's sanity and relationships with each other deteriorate and then it gets pushed into horror territory so it goes from being a slice of life movie to a slice <laughs> uh, boom all right rim shot there so the <laughs> the elements of psychological horror I, I think to me are are scarier than what you'd get out of say horror based off like a you know a Nightmare on Elm Street kind of a horror, something like that. The psychological stuff, the fear of the unknown, what's going to happen, you know, you don't know what to expect, to me is scarier than just a dude running around trying to stab you in the back of the head with a knife. Um, so what's what's scary to you? Like what makes Fang a horror film uh, that, that people that are viewing it can kind of understand your perception and direction that you wanted to take the horror to? Well, I think probably the most disturbing thing about Fang, well, the rat transformation can be pretty graphic at some points as you see the rat fur start to emerge from under Billy's skin. Right. It can be kind of a disturbing image, although I think the most disturbing thing for me is just kind of seeing the psychology of the characters and how they kind of get themselves into this situation. Because I think there are a lot of, you know, most movie characters that I've seen are are somewhat healthier than most of the people I know who aren't movie characters. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, you know, movie characters are very, you know, dynamic. They make all these decisions, you know, to survive. Then they, they fight these monsters. They conquer the monsters but in in fang the characters are very dysfunctional and they kind of torment each other because of their own sort of sick delusional tendencies and so i think i think probably the most disturbing thing about the movie is just seeing the way the characters interact with each other and how they cause so many of their own problems but they don't even realize it because they're so blind to the reality of, you know, what they should be doing. Yeah. And I think that is ultimately the most disturbing thing about the movie, even more disturbing than the idea of a man turning into a rat. 
Sure. <laughs> yeah, the the lack of self awareness um, it seems to be kind of a big part of this movie, but I don't think it's as in your face as that. Kind of the perception I get is that there might be this, whether or not it's underlying or or maybe just like right below the surface. But is there kind of a kind of a take on? on either like mental illness or or derangement or some kind of just lack of of uh, ability to see the world as it is oh absolutely i mean i think i think most of the major characters in fang are, are mentally ill or deranged in some way and then i do have some more normal characters to balance them out but like the family caregiver, Myra, she makes a noble effort to reach Billy and Gina, but, and that's another disturbing thing about the movie too, is that we see how she's in over her head and that the kind of normalcy and the kind of the normal things that you would use to treat people like, you know, therapy or meditation sure, or, you know, or prescription drugs and how that's ultimately ineffective with these characters because they're too far gone. They're too deep in the muck <laughs> to really be reached easily. Yeah. When you were writing this, did you take any kind of elements from your own life and find yourself putting them into characters? Like is Billy, for instance, any reflection on you yourself? He is, definitely. Well, I would say that Billy is a good bit more severe than than me. I've never thought I was turning into a rat. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Right. But I would say that Billy is, is kind of a, a reflection of kind of my more, some of my darker and more, you know, unhinged tendencies. Like, I wrote Billy as an autistic character, and I have high-functioning Asperger, so I'm, like, very oh. high-functioning on the spectrum. Yeah, and uh, Billy is somewhat lower-functioning. He is less aware of all the mistakes he makes socially and in in, in, in how he fails in his interactions with people. And he also has other problems, like being obsessive-compulsive, and I have OCD, too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and he's uh, depressed, and I've had problems with depression sure. over the years, too. So, and, and Billy's mother, Gina, was based a lot on my dad. And, you know, Gina has Parkinson's. My dad has Parkinson's. And some of the dialogue uh, between them is, like, almost word for word from different arguments right. I've had with my dad. So, yeah, definitely a lot of it was based on different experiences I've had. Was that kind of an intentional thing, do you think, as you were writing it? Or did you write it and realize, wait a second, that just kind of popped out, and now I'm going to run with this? It was uh, it was definitely intentional, because I think some of the parallels are so obvious, so it would have to be yeah. pretty oblivious not to <laughs> have intended it. Sure. Do uh, people that know you, <laughs> the people that know you closely anyway, are they going to watch this and go, God damn, Richard, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, when I showed the uh, script to my mom, well, she was able to pick it out right yeah. away. But this was about people who don't know my uh, family quite as well, might not necessarily see it right away. But, yeah, a lot of it is drawn yeah. from my life. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. So the the perception of, you know, kind of as you're you're writing something and you say you can put yourself into it and kind of make it fictional, kind of I don't want to use the word embellish, but you kind of draw from those experiences, I think really makes amazing characters that even if they're kind of, you know, off the deep end, something about them still makes them relatable. And the characters that you've written in this, they seem to be the kind of people that they're very close knit. They know each other very well. They're so closely bonded that it, then it makes it difficult for them to escape that reality. Well, that is a, a great way to put it because yeah, you're right. They are, you know, because it's mother and son relationship. That's the core of the movie. And 
obviously, you know, Billy is, is known as Mother Gina for his whole life. Sure. And they are very closely connected and they have a long history together. And that's part of why they're so toxic because they can't escape each other. They're both, they're, they're kind of bound together by their, each of their disabilities and they can't really, you know, get into the outside world because they have their own little sick inner worlds that dominate. When you were writing this, did you know from the get go that you were going to take a horror approach to this or did it kind of start out as a drama and evolve down the psychological rabbit hole? Well, I, I did. Well, the whole concept of turning into a rat, that was kind of what spurred me to write it. So I always kind of intended for it to go in that direction. Yeah. And now you didn't go to film school, did you? Like no. officially. So you're self-taught, you know, more or less using whatever resources were available to you. So as you are kind of researching and learning kind of how this stuff works, as you were writing it, did you write what you felt was at your level to make this happen? Or did you have ideas and you were like, how the hell am I going to pull this off? Well, I did write it intentionally so it could be filmed on a low budget. And there were a couple of things where I, I wondered how we were going to pull it off, but thankfully you know, we figured out how to do it. And that's, that's the great thing about working with really, you know, talented professional people is that (laughs) they kind of round out whatever you don't know going into it. So I would always say that to any director is make sure you hire the best people because it's going to make your job a hell of a lot easier. Yeah. When you were putting this all together, so you, you got, you got the script written at least to the point where, you're ready to go out and show it to people in the industry, if you will. How did you convince people to follow you, first-time filmmaker, not going through film school, to join you on this project? Well, the way I well, actually, that part was pretty pretty simple. I, I you know I looked up different people in the Chicago area who could do it. I sent an email to my cinematographer Jason Cranick, and I said, hey, you know. I wrote this script. I would wonder if you'd be interested in going on board in this project. So then Jason read it. He really liked it. And then he brought on board his friend, our producer, Robert Felker. And then the ball got rolling from there. So that part went by pretty quickly. Actually, I think everybody just really liked the script. So that makes things a lot easier. Yeah. So you didn't really have a, a necessarily a challenging time getting people on board and, and getting people excited about it. That's, oh, that was the easy part. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I suppose that's, you know, that kind of makes sense because, you know, there are people that just gravitate towards others that are doing things. But, uh, you know, knowing your timeline and how quickly that you got this going quickly, I say in a relative term, because outside of the industry, it seems quick. Uh, or it seems like it might take forever, but inside the industry, <laughs> you're like, wow, this is happening faster, you know, kind of than the average stuff. So you got actors on board, you got a cinematographer, you've got a producer. And then from there, uh, how long did it take before you actually started shooting? Well, I think, well, we got the main production team on board in uh, September, and then we started filming in January. We originally... We were originally going to start filming in uh, November. Then there were some delays that pushed us back to January. And, you know, I was not looking forward to filming in the winter in Chicago for obvious reasons. But we turned out to be very fortunate that we chose to film then because like a month after we finished filming, the shutdown happened. Oh, right. COVID stuff. (laughs) So if I had waited until it was warmer, like like people wanted me to, that I would have been screwed. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. You know, I hadn't thought about that element of it, but you got the principal photography done. Like it was, it was about February, Just right? Yeah. So, so <laughs> any, uh, the processes that you're in right now, not to go down another rabbit hole, but I mean, the, the COVID situation as it stands right now did not affect the majority of the production of your project. Oh, it didn't, it didn't affect any of the production. The post-production has been going on throughout these 
you know, past months, but that's all, you know, it, in people's homes on computers. So that wasn't really affected by the shutdown. The main thing that has affected post-production is me being overly ambitious <laughs> with the time frame it takes to get things done. Like I remember when we finished filming, I was like, hey, we can get the whole movie done by the end of June. And my producer was like, no, we can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to put this in perspective yeah, no, for people right. that, that that aren't familiar kind of with how filming works, and I, I do in my, my, we'll call it my real person job, um, I do a lot of audio and video work and, and working on, on film sets and things like that. Filming a simple line like, hey, come over here for a second, that takes you three seconds to say it, might take you eight hours to get it set up, to set up the shot, to get all the stuff right, to make sure the <laughs> circumstances are right, and then to make sure that it just kind of works, right? And people don't really realize how long no, it takes no. to do a simple take. Um, and then, of course, actors sometimes overthink that stuff. And, you know, you, you know, 50 takes later of, you know, three words um, is pretty crazy. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and just actually for my, my techno, geeky, nerdy film stuff, did you, how many cameras did you use on this? Well, we, we, it was a, a single camera shoot we had in, uh, I think it was an RED cameras, either 4K or... 6k and we didn't and we filmed it from different angles you know for each shot and in each scene and we we didn't usually have to do a lot of different takes our actors and crew were very professional i think the most takes we did was like eight or nine takes for one scene that for some reason we were struggling with and normally it only took us like two or three hours to get it wow. set up so we yeah we were we were pretty lucky and, and efficient definitely so you shot this digitally yeah yeah so you know it's it's a uh, the the advance in technology at this point is is pretty remarkable you know what you can do with minimal equipment is is awesome were you thinking about that as you were writing did you know you were going to take that route you know go the one camera route and do digital and stuff like that well, I am not the uh, most te technologically knowledgeable filmmaker. My instincts in terms of the filming of Fang was find a great cinematographer and entrust him with figuring out the best camera yeah. and filming oh. and lighting approach to use. And if it looks like the movie in my head, that's the most important thing to me. But I do definitely see advantages to using digital cameras now that you know they've improved in quality because you know filming on film can get very expensive yeah if you need a lot of uh film but like i think i i noticed like you know 10 years ago you could really tell when something was filmed on digital because it looked kind of dim generally compared to film but now i don't really see that problem as much I think the cameras have evolved a lot, even just in the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I, uh, I, I definitely am somebody who struggles with technology, but just as I learn something, I feel like now the world has moved on to something else. So I always feel <laughs> like I'm, I'm like that couple of steps behind, you know, where I really want to be. But I, I, I tend to embrace the prior gen of technology and that's drag true, it out, yeah. you know, for, for as long as humanly possible. But, uh, I, I think that's well, I awesome to learn how the uh, big cameras work. I'm like my lovely cinematographer. That is your job. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's that theory, right? You surround yourself with people that are better than you. And, oh, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I believe that, you know, I was in management roles. That is really important to do. I mean, you can't do every single job yourself. It's not a one man show. Yeah. Well, you know, and that, that's, that actually is a perfect segue into what I wanted to bring up next. So a lot of times those of us that have creative endeavors and things become our passion project, things that we put ourselves into so much have a hard time kind of letting go um, and not being, we'll call it the film dictator, right? Or the, or the music <laughs> dictator. So how was it for you once you finally got this project off the ground and you started working with actors and started working with cinematographers and you saw people saying and doing the things that came out of your head? 
How was that experience for you as you were first getting involved in that? Well, I think the area where I, I, I made the most mistakes was thinking I could do more things that I could actually do because I kind of underestimated how much work just being the writer and director is. But over time, you know, one thing I will say that is definitely a strength of mine is that I'm a very open-minded guy. I'm always willing, you know, to listen to people. And if somebody says something that makes sense, then I'll get on board with it, you know, regardless of where the idea comes from. I'm not, I'm not somebody who likes to intimidate my cast and crew, you know, and that, that is the advantage of being a relatively, you know, inexperienced director is that I'm not intimidating, you know, people are not afraid to tell me if I'm screwing something up. So, and that's a good thing because, you know, people, you know, you have to, you have to be willing to listen to people if you want to grow as a filmmaker and get the movie made as, as well as it can, you know, and I think that if you look at directors who have become really successful, like the example I always like to bring up is uh, George Lucas with the Star Wars prequels. Nobody wanted to tell him that it could have been a lot better because he's George Lucas. He's one of the most successful directors of all time with the most successful franchise yeah. of all time. So that could be in Achilles heel when you get to that point that people are afraid to give you feedback. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And, and uh, even if it's not the case, even if you're not like a, a super, you know, film Nazi, that persona sometimes that gets built up around you, this aura of mystique that people are just apprehensive. I don't, I don't want to offend him. I don't know what to say. You know, there's, there's very funny stories about directors, like say, uh, Jan de Bont, who did like uh, Twister, for instance, about him being very difficult to work with. And he was very much like, you're going to do this because this is my movie and this is how I see it. And I'm going <laughs> to do a thousand takes until you get it exactly right. Clearly that's not the direction you took on this. No. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I I always look at it as you know we just we just have to do what works for the movie you know I get no real pleasure out of you know doing more takes than the necessary I want to get the show on the road yeah too I don't like standing outside when it's like thirty degrees out and saying <laughs> all right we're gonna need another twenty takes for this yeah. shot so that's, you'll... that's not my idea of of fun so once we get it once we get it done right and. You know, every everything is as it should be. I don't feel the need to torture people yeah. beyond that point. So you learn to be flexible. You learn to oh, kind of yeah. take some input, and uh, and and I think to your credit, it sounds like just the way that this went together, the planning you put into it, and everything was was just really well from the start set up to be successful in that sense. Yeah, I mean, it went a lot better than it could have. You know, we had our problems, but I've heard some absolute horror stories about... <laughs> no pun <so> intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, horror stories and not just uh, the movie itself. Yeah, right. But, yeah, yeah like, I, I, I read this long uh, article recently about this movie called Grizzly 2 that was being made in 1983, and it's just getting released this year. Damn. <laughs> I was yeah, like, did I hear that right? 83? Yeah. To 2020. Yeah, it's a 37-year uh, delay. So when I look at that, I think, all right, well, post-production took a couple months longer than I would have liked. That's not so bad in comparison. Yeah. That's Yeah, that, that's awesome. And of course, especially on an independent uh, film, usually delays come from the filmmaker themselves, whether or not they're satisfied with kind of how things are going. Whereas in the studio world, a studio might get bought or sold or CEOs might, you know, take oh, over yeah. and, you know, you know, there's a, there's massive amounts of personnel change and producers come and go and financing comes and goes. And, you know, that you was can... the case with uh, Grizzly too. It was like one disaster after another. And it was amazing uh, story to read about because it just gets stranger and stranger as you look at like, how could they get screwed so many <laughs> times over and over again? Yeah. So you told me about the awesome, uh, you know, poltergeist level TV catching on fire thing. 
besides, I wish we'd gotten a shot of that and put it in the <laughs> I, movie. That would have been a great shot. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, that would have been a great psychological mind fuck to have in the movie right there for sure. But uh, besides that, what was the other craziest event that happened during the filming? Well, that that was definitely the the craziest uh, by far. I think the other craziest event, well, just some of the, uh, well, there was actually one day where I got to be in the movie because we had different, we had, we had several different dream sequences where, you know, Billy gets talked to by the rat King. Yeah. <laughs> so for one day I got to play the rat King and that was a pretty wild experience for me because I got to put on the uh, rat makeup and then wear this rat mask in doctor's outfit. And then I went out there and then I got to wave my paws around. Nice. <laughs> that was a pretty crazy day. So you actually <laughs> got to, you got to take on a little bit of a, of an acting credit, at least for that one little portion. For that one scene. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Just add it to the resume, you know, writer, director, yeah. actor, you know, so no, that's <laughs> awesome, dude. So, oh, and then you. Yeah. what, what about, what do you think has been the most humbling experience of making a movie for you? Well, I think just all of the things that, which I was talking about some before about, you know, realizing that I can't do quite as many different jobs as I thought I could. That's a very humbling experience from now on. I've made a pledge to, you know, stick with the writing, stick with the directing and maybe have a few Hitchcock like appearances. Ah. In my movies, <laughs> like when I got to be the Red King. But yeah. Or Scorsese, he's kind of known to do that. Had it once. That was very, that was very humbling. For yeah, me. that's awesome. You know, I, I always like, you know, for instance, like uh, Scorsese will always kind of sneak into a scene here and there. You know, maybe he's a oh, waiter, like the taxi driver, where oh. he's the gets into the back of the cab. Nero, and he's like the kind of really racist. Yeah. Unhinged. <laughs> that was a very good scene. I love Taxi Driver. In fact, I know you can't see it, but behind me, I have a Taxi Driver movie poster, uh, oh, you know, yeah. hanging on my wall. But um, man, that, well, that was a big influence for me making Fang. Is Billy is a little bit like uh, Travis, like Travis Bickle, Bickle yeah. He's, he's like this case, this loner. He's this outsider who's kind of going insane in this very gritty urban environment. Yeah. Taxi Driver is one of those movies that you watch it a thousand times, right? And then every time you watch it, you kind of pick up a little something that you didn't before. But I think my favorite scene in that movie, because the guy is just has zero social skills, right? He has no idea, right? So he... <laughs> So he hooks up with uh, with uh, Sybil Shepherd, and he wants to take her on a date. And what does he do? He takes her to a porn movie, <laughs> and he's and she's clearly uncomfortable, right? And he's like, "Oh, I don't see the problem. You know what's going?" On? And she's like, "I want to get the hell out of here." And he's like, "What's wrong with you?" You know, just that idea that that was even something that was that people would like to do in that context <laughs> in that setting. Uh, it was really great. I, I think that's one of the things I like about that, that particular movie. Scene. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also part of it, too, is like, you know, New York in the 70s. I mean, Times Square was mostly porn theaters. It was very seedy, yeah. Back then, yeah. So I, I could see why Travis would think that it was just like a normal thing. Yeah. Still, because that's what his environment was. And my dad lived in New York back then, and he said, yeah, that's just what it was like. You know, there was porn theaters and prostitutes everywhere, and, and that's just what the city was so I, I think that because he didn't realize that her character was from a different social class. Yeah. And we thought, yeah, this is just a normal thing to do, you know. <laughs> uh, I really like I really like that that element of, of movies. And I, I I get the impression that Fang kind of also gives you that that uh, impression that maybe the characters in this movie don't really have a, a broader sense of understanding about what's going on in the outside world. Oh, no, they don't. They are <laughs> they are pretty dysfunctional in that regard. So, as a filmmaker, uh, what's your take on on like Hollywood or you know whatever the film industry doing all of these reboots? You know, kind of remaking old movies. It's a very controversial topic. Um, how do you feel about that? 
Well, I think that the major studios are in trouble now. You know, they're very risk averse and they're and you know, when you don't really have fresh ideas coming in and out of your studio system, that's a sign that you're not you're not you're kind of going downhill basically yeah and uh, i think that if you look at you know all the different streaming services you know they're the future the old the old guard is uh kind of on its last legs and i think all the remakes and reboots are a sign of that they're just kind of they're clinging to their intellectual property instead of of getting new intellectual property because they don't want to take those risks and adapt to you know the changing world yeah i i've heard many a rumor that there is somebody out there a big name person who is behind basically trying to redo the original star wars trilogy and uh they already, they already basically did remake star wars it was called the force Awakens. yeah 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 it's it's basically that's the cycle is all all of the prequels have kind of revisited the old material for sure that's a a joke i have with a lot of my friends that get really super hot about it when i bring it up and i'm like hey, you know it is what it is what did yeah, you I mean, think they're already, they're already making they already made like five different star wars movies in the last five years why do they need to remake exactly the original trilogy too and then taking a remake to the extreme, for instance, what did you think about, because I'm sure you saw it, uh, Gus Van Sant's shot-by-shot shot Psycho redo? Well, that's actually a movie that I haven't seen because I didn't feel the need to watch it because it's literally shot-for-shot. Shot shot-for-shot. At Psycho, but Psycho, the original, is one of my all-time favorite movies. And I guess I give Gus Van Sant credit for at least thinking that he couldn't improve on it. But then if he can't improve on it, then why the hell is he doing it in the first place? It's just kind of a baffling thing. I, I guess that's the thing is I'm like, it, it kind of took me by surprise that it wasn't like just an homage, for instance. It was like, I just want to prove to you that I can do what he did. That was kind of how I took it. Like, And it didn't... Yeah, but then the problem with that is that Hitchcock already did it. Yeah. So you're not, you're not Hitchcock if you could do shot for shot the same thing as Hitchcock because Hitchcock had to blaze the trail. He was a pioneer. Yeah. He wasn't copying anything else that was out there. Yeah. It was, uh, I don't know. It, it I don't, would say it rubbed me the wrong way because it wasn't bad. I mean, it, it's nothing bad well, about I mean, it. I, would, I mean, you can't really screw it up too badly yeah. because it's still psycho. It's still a masterpiece. Right. That you're drawing from. But yeah, it's one of those movies that I don't really have a strong desire to watch just because it's you know i really wouldn't be seeing anything different in the original psycho you know i I, i'm such a it means so much to me that i just don't really feel the need to bother i always wondered what that what that pitch sounded like at first you know he's at the studio (laughs) they're sitting down they're all you know hanging out waiting for this epic he's like all right check this out i've got this fucking brilliant idea all right we're gonna take psycho and we're gonna remake it and the studio head's gone "Eh." it's been a while all right cool I, yeah, I could do that and then he's like all right no but i mean we're gonna remake it i mean we're, we're gonna we're gonna take it and we're gonna make it exactly the same exactly <laughs> like not change a thing other than the actors because you know they're all dead or whatever but uh yeah we're gonna do what he did exactly and the guy's like huh so let me understand this you're gonna make a movie that's already been made Exactly as it was already made. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's gonna be awesome. And how much money do you want? <laughs> and then they gave it to him. So I was like, I know. Well, I think that well, part of it, I guess, is you know, reverence to the original movie. You know, because you're, you're really, I mean, Psycho. The only thing I would change is that you know the ending where they explain Norman's uh, psychology. Psychosis. Yeah. That part is a little bit uh, dated, but. Everything other than that is basically perfect, so he can't really improve on it. So I guess that was probably Gus Van Sant's thinking. But then that should he should have taken that to the next step and realizing that, well, if I can't improve on it, then there's not really a reason to remake it right. in the first place. Yeah, for sure. So you wrapped in February. You're in post-production now. 
where exactly are you in post-production? What final process is coming coming to us? Because we know, at least anticipation, we're looking at maybe November, right? That's kind of the goal as yeah. of right now. So yeah, how my, close is it? Yeah, my current plan is to have the online premiere in November. And we're definitely, we're very close to, you know, finishing post-production. We're in the final stage. Now we just have to do color grading and sound mixing. And that's basically it. And after that, you know, the movie will be all done and we'll have our online premiere. And after that, we're going to get a distribution deal for Fang. So it'll go out and get a much wider audience. My top choices would be to get it on Netflix or Amazon Prime, mm -hmm. you know, so it can reach the widest possible network of people who have it. But if they're not interested in it, someone else will. Fang will definitely be finding a home somewhere yeah. out there with all the different studios and streaming services who are releasing content. And anyone who doesn't tune into our online premiere in November can expect to see the movie creeping around the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I like that, creeping Thanks. around. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. They can expect to see it in 2021 if... They don't tune into our online premiere. Like in a physical theater release or anything like that? Well, I would love to get it in theaters, but, you know, there aren't that many movies that get released in theaters now. It's Not right now, yeah. <laughs> so as far as your premiere, uh, is it too soon to say where it's going to premiere? Well, it's going to be online. I haven't gotten everything set up yet or the exact date or time, but I'm probably going to try to do it, like, on the weekend like on Sunday, so everybody is off work. Right. And, and like on it, create a, it. like its own website for the project and just view it right off the, off the movie site, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely, I'm working on uh, getting a website. You know, I have so many different projects going on awesome. right now. That's kind of been on the back burner for now, but I'm definitely, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get it set up and, I'll have more details about when we're going to have the premiere and how people will be able to watch Fang once we get closer to that point. Awesome. Well, it sounds like things are wrapping up. We're almost there. I'm really excited for this project. So before I let you get back to your day, I want to play a quick little game of pick, oh, your, cool. pick your poison. And this is where I ask you to make the impossible choice between two things. Are you ready for this? Okay, sure. All right, here we go. So Friday the 13th or Halloween? I got to go with uh, Halloween on this one. Okay, awesome. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I'm uh, going to go with Texas Chainsaw. Yeah, yes. good man. <laughs> What's the reason behind that one? Well, I think that, well, I guess I think the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a somewhat better movie the original Nightmare on Elm Street. I think it's just, it's very, you know, gritty and uh, realistic. And it was a very influential to the genre of, you know, maniacs wielding <laughs> sharp bladed weapons. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and uh, Poltergeist or The Exorcist? I'm uh, going to go with The Exorcist. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. Two psychological movies for sure there with the, uh, with just crazy stuff going on. Uh, That's right. Child's Play or Annabelle? Hmm, that's a tough one. I guess the, I guess Chucky has a little bit more of a sense of humor, so I'm going to go with Child's Play. <laughs> All right. The Thing or The Ring? Hmm, and then you got him to rhyme uh, this time. Yeah, that was uh, that was unintentional. I was pretty proud of myself when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm uh i just have to go with the thing yeah i'm gonna stick with the classics on that one <laughs> awesome <laughs> so all right uh here we go last one a uh, little little uh movie nerd production stuff here and i don't even know if this is stuff that you use but okay. movie magic screenwriter or final draft 
I don't use either of those. I use uh, Keltex. So oh, Keltex. This is a, a neutral category for me. <laughs> <laughs> Go on the open source. Look at you. So, uh, well, hey, dude, this has been absolutely epic. I I've had a blast talking with you. Yeah, uh, yeah this has been a great uh, interview. Thank you so much for having me on. I think we covered a lot of great ground here. And uh, I hope everybody who watches Fang has a fantastic time. Whoa, look at that, throwing it out there. I love it, dude. <laughs> yeah, so uh, tell everybody out there in, see, Radio Land, how do they stock you on social media and keep track of the progress so that when Fang is finally released, they'll know kind of all the details and where they can go? Well, the uh, best place to find out more about Fang as of now is our uh, Facebook page, Fang colon the movie, and that is a great resource. We have a lot of different pictures from the production, different people writing about the movies. You can hear my take on it, the actors take on it and see some of our amazing shots of, you know, filming. And when, when I look back at everything we've amassed, you know, it, it really, it really does look pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so go on the Facebook page, uh, Fang colon the movie, like the page, get all the cool updates, look at all those badass production stills. I promise you, it'll make you twice as excited. Uh, it's just, it's really, really cool. They've done a fantastic job of keeping people enticed with just little tidbits of awesomeness here and there. So, uh, Richard, thank you again for joining me on Misery Point Radio. It's been awesome to talk with you, and I can't wait till the release, and you can count on my support when it launches to help you spread the good word, my friend. Uh, you're very welcome, Mike, and thank you for being so dedicated to the Fang cause, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you, brother. You too.